How to Change Your Dragon by Francine Castile. When Greta Sanson woke up one morning from unsettling dreams, she found her eight-month-old daughter had transformed into a baby dragon. Obviously, she assumed she was still dreaming at first. The cot was beside their bed, so on hearing the 7 a.m. wail, a little rough around the edges than usual, perhaps, she'd rolled over and peeked through the bars to check on Poppy. What she saw, what she thought she saw, she told herself, muddling back into the pillow, lying on its back, four legs curled across its chest, was a chubby, lizard-like creature, covered in iridescent green-blue scales, the colour and sheen of a peacock's feathers. Its hooded eyes gazed sleepily at the wooden pepper pig mobile that dangled above the cot. Forty minutes later, Greta suddenly sat bolt upright in bed, her nostrils twitching. The pepper pig mobile was on fire. The non-toxic pastel paint bubbling and crisping. The baby safe tangle-proof strings burned half through and smouldering. The scaly creature now occupying Poppy's baby sleeping bag was gurgling throatily and batting at the drifting flakes of ash. A gnawed chunk of mummy pig protruded from its lipless mouth, lit by tiny blue and yellow flames. Greta stared at the charred crystal for a long, horrified moment. Then she reached for the Evian on the windowsill and scattered the contents over the cot, dousing the remaining fires. Needless to say, Reese, lying next to her, had still not woken up, although the rather pleasant aroma of burning beechwood was now very strong. She glanced back at the drenched little reptile, spluttering and sneezing wetly. The creature, all right, it was clearly a dragon, but there was still something poppyish about it, stared back at her, golden brown eyes rapidly filling with tears. Greta kicked Reese. <gasps> the dragon's pointed ears perked at the sound, and its mouth opened in a surprisingly pink smile. Poppy had always been a daddy's girl. <gasps> said, as in reply. Like Poppy, it had five teeth, two on the top and three on the bottom. They looked considerably more business-like than Poppy's milk-white bud so, and Greta who had always been an evangelistic champion of breastfeeding, found herself considering the dusty formula bottles at the back of the cupboard. Reese rose up behind her like a leviathan from the deep. He worked a lot of late nights at a graphic design company and was never at his best in the morning. He squinted at the dragon, which, having burned through half of its sleeping bag, had shook the rest and now clung unsteadily to the bars of the cot with its pearly claws. Naked, but for the, poppy, the, the pampers nappy, Poppy had gone to bed in the night before. Bloody hell, said Reese. What's up with Pops? Some sort of allergic reaction? <laughs> Greta handed him his glasses and then his iPhone. Put these on, she said, and then call the doctor. Dr. Hall was her local GP, and also a specialist paediatrician with designer specs, a caramel soft voice, and a grade one buzz cut topped by a stripe of slicked back hair, which Greta suspected became a phone hawk when he went clubbing in Shoreditch at weekends. He was always incredibly good with Poppy, so much so that when the baby was being particularly appalling, Greta sometimes fantasized about leaving her outside his office in a Moses basket with a note saying simply, You understand? It hadn't been easy to explain the reason for the emergency appointment. In the end, they fudged it with some half truths about scaly skin and running a temperature. <laughs> Swaddled in a fireproof baby blanket, under which was a layer of tinfoil, Bruce's idea. The baby dragon seemed as cosy as a baked potato, sucking drowsily on its razor sharp thorn claw. Greta had curtained the pram with a white muslin and resisted drawing back the, the fabric for the whole bus journey. Now, as Ruth manoeuvred the bugaboo into Dr. Hall's office, a faint, wild hope leapt in her that when they pulled the cloth back, 
their soft, pink baby girl would magically have been restored. This wasn't what happened. Instead, before Dr. Hall could lift the muslin, there was a sustained burp and a jet of orange flame blasted a perfect circle into the center of the fabric. The dragon peered through the charred hole in apparent delight, a thin line of milky drool adorning its green chin. I told you not to feed her on the bus, Reese nodded, Sasha watching. She's all shut up now. Greta winced. The idea of a hungry dragon clawing through the planhood in search of sustenance had been too embarrassing. Despite a quick, desperate search, she had no idea what dragons ate. Virgins aside, so she'd given it the carton of Aptamil kept at the bottom of the pram for emergencies. Hmm, said Dr. Wall, tipping up the dragon's chin and staring into its great glassy eyes. Well, this is unusual. Unusual? said Reese, with Greta considered admirable restraint. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hall lifted the creature, holding it under its forelegs so that it dangled, wriggling from his hands. Oh, puppy! Right? We think so, said Greta, dubiously. Dr. Hall smiled. <laughs> you thought maybe a changeling? <laughs> no. Don't worry, it's nothing like that. This is your baby, all right. Just a little scaly today, huh, princess? He tickled the dragon till she gurgled, then settled her comfortably on his hip, where she proceeded to claw razor slashes in his expensive-looking shirt. Dr. Hall was either too cool to notice or didn't care. So, he said, good news is she's flaming well, bright and active, third eyelid working fine, you guys look a little shell-shocked, but I guess you'll recover. You know, I'm surprised they didn't give you the pamphlet when you were in the hospital, Mrs. Samson. I mean, it tells you what to expect around eight months. I mean, some kids transform earlier, six months maybe, but Poppy here is right on track. Did you have any other concerns? White spot? Scale loss? Greta and Reese looked at each other. Pamphlet was all Greta managed. In reply, Dr. Hall bent to the bottom drawer of his desk, releasing Poppy, where she immediately crawled towards Reese, burping as she went, leaving a trail of scratched and scorched liner. He resurfaced, holding a dusty booklet with a cartoon of a red baby dragon on the front, waving a silver rattle in large, friendly letters, like the magnets on their fridge back home. It said, So you're having a dragon. It's all in here, he said. <laughs> Obviously, without amniotic tests, we can't know 100% you're popping out a little fire breather. But the register usually identifies likely couples. Did, did neither of you know you had dragon blood? Greta and Reese exchanged another glance. I'm all negative, said Greta. <laughs> I'm adopted, said Reese. Dr. Wolf frowned at Reese. That's a Welsh accent I hear, though. If your mum or dad was from one of the royal bloodlines, it's actually pretty common there. Nobody talks about it, though. Especially to the English, eh? <laughs> he laughed. Reese didn't. Dr. Hall glanced at Greta. Her white blonde hair and blue eyes. But in the maternal line, you don't have any Asian ancestry, do you? Sweden, by way of Shropshire, she said. Really? That is odd. There must be some reason you two have produced a full-blooded emerald. He pulled up her notes on his screen and scanned them. Poppy, who had been gnawing Reese's trainer with her canines, suddenly started wriggling around on the floor un uncomfortably. A faint miasma of yellowy-green gas escaped from the back of her dungarees, and... Within seconds, Greta was choking, her eyes streaming with burning tears. The unflappable Dr. Hall clapped a surgical mask to his face and passed her another. Reese coughed a bit, but um, otherwise seemed fine. He reached for the discarded tin foil and wrapped it round Poppy's steaming bottle. 
then sat her firmly on his lap. Yeah, <laughs> chuckled Dr. Hall, who was taking this all far too cheerfully for Greta's taste. That's one of the drawbacks of infant dragons, apart from the breath, of course. You have to buy the special nappies with the aluminium weave. Anything else just gets eaten straight through. It's a digestive acid, you see. But don't worry, you can get pouches. Baby-proofing is a challenge, though. You'll go through quite a few cribs. Thank God for free cycle, eh? <laughs> so, it's there. Uh, Greta found it hard to frame the question. She wasn't even sure what she knew what to ask. No, I mean, is it permanent? Will she, will we be like this forever? Is the condition incurable? Dr. Hall made funny fingers with his ears. Funny ears with his fingers. <laughs> Sorry, Katie. Which that oddly and suddenly serious face. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Samson, first of all, you have to realise that having a dragon child is much commoner than you think. We don't shout it from the rooftops because of the obvious problems of prejudice and panic, but it's an open secret amongst the medical and draconic communities. Not to mention the baby product manufacturers, right? Can't keep a lucrative market from them, eh? And it's not a debilitating condition. You just have to make a few allowances and changes. Just like if your child was colorblind or lactose intolerant, maybe. There's no cure, because it's not a disease. And as soon as Poppy learns to take control of the metamorphosis, that's usually around the time as they start talking, you won't have to keep her out of sight in the dragon phase either. It's all in the pamphlet. Oh, and here's a pack of those special nappies. I always keep some handy in case of accidents. He passed Greta a slim, discreet silver bag, stamped with the brand name Aluminium, <laughs> and the stylized puff of flame. As they shook hands at the door, Poppy safely stowed in the darkness of her pram, where she gnawed busily at the shredded corpse of the river giraffe. Dr. Hall crinkled his lovely, clever eyes and smiled at Greta. Don't worry, Mrs. Samson, he said softly. You'll adjust in no time. We love our kids no matter what, right? Besides, she'll be back to her, normal, in no time. Greta wasn't so sure. When they got back home, Reese bathed Poppy and put her to bed. His skin seemed to be a lot more flame resistant than Greta's, and he was also radiating this almost palpable air of smugness at discovering he was of royal dragon blood. <laughs> Meanwhile, Greta ran for a takeaway, thinking that today of all days they both definitely deserved one. They sat in silence watching Game of Thrones with a wholly new level of interest, <laughs> until Reese reached across and squeezed her hand. I've been thinking, love. Weren't you born in the year of the dragon? He showed her his iPhone screen with a list of years. 1988 was among them. Oh, yeah, she said. I never thought of it before. Later, when she went up to check on the little dragon, whose cot Reese had now lined with a silver blanket from his Ben Nevis climbing stag weekend, Greta was astonished just to see how much in sleep. It really did look like Poppy. It was splayed on its back arms akimbo, little claws half curled, and as Greta leaned over, its eyes flickered open for a second, flashing golden brown. Still Poppy's eyes. On impulse, Greta put her thumb into the small, scaly fist, and instantly, just like Poppy always did, the dragon pulled it into her mouth, sucking vigorously until a few drops of blood came. <laughs> Greta winced, but decided that after a three-day labour, cracked nipples and projectile poo, she could pretty much get used to anything. <laughs>